Welcome to episode 27 of the Strategic Momentum Podcast. I'm your host, Connie Steele. Over the past decade, there's been a trend towards or even movement of brands and businesses being a force for good. Many of these organizations are succeeding in business. And there's a science to support the idea that being more altruistic, being more purpose-driven is a potent recipe for business success as well as personal fulfillment. To learn more about the science of altruism and why purpose is more than just trendy, I talk with Dr. Richard Schuster, a former IT executive turned licensed clinical psychologist and the host of the popular internationally downloaded podcast, The Daily Helping. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today, Dr. Richard. It is an honor to be here, Connie. Thank you for having me. So I'd love for you to share your career journey with us as you've certainly had quite a story that has led you to where you are today. It's really funny because if I go back 20 years or so, I would never have envisioned in any way, shape or form that I'd be doing what I'm doing today. And in my mid-20s, this was in the late 90s. So we're talking tech boom. If you could chew gum and talk at the same time, somebody would give you pretty decent money as an IT consultant. And I figured that out on my own and actually started an IT consulting company. We bid on a government contract through the military and we won. Kind of like if you remember back back in the day, they used to have these commercials for UPS and they would show uh, a website and somebody would get an online sale and they would get another and they were celebrating. And then as the numbers started to roll and they had thousands of, of customers, they were freaking out. And then so UPS was the logistics for them. It was kind of the same thing. I I didn't actually expect to win this government bid, but it pushed me into a direction that I wasn't expecting to go. And so I began building the infrastructure around this consulting agency. Something really crazy happened while I was doing that is that I was nearly killed in a car accident. Wow. Yeah. And a lot of people talk metaphorically about you know, quote unquote, life changing experiences, or when they're about to die, they see their lives flash before their eyes. So, when you look at the, the research from a neuroscience standpoint, it's really quite interesting. And we have data going back, you know, literally, soldiers who've written letters during war talking about this. There's a, there's a gentleman named David Eagleman who's probably the top neuroscience expert on this phenomenon. But I experienced essentially the slowing down of time. That is, if you envision this car accident that I was in, I was turning left. Somebody slammed straight into me. This maybe took place over two seconds from when the car impacted me and then I my airbag deployed and I was sent back into oncoming traffic and only stopped when my driver's side slammed into a, a telephone pole, essentially. Um, <laughs> it didn't feel like two or three seconds. I was literally in that time able to have this lengthy dialogue with myself, a full conversation in which I'm saying to myself, I'm about to die. And the first thought that came to my head was, what's it going to be like for my parents to get that phone call? And the shame I felt about that, that they were going to be called by the police and informed that that I was killed in this accident. And then my next thought, which was fully fleshed out, was what have I really done? Like, What am I proud of? What have I accomplished? And I made some money. I traveled. You know, I, I really you know, enjoyed things and, and things for the sake of having things, not things because I was you know, deeply interested in what they represented or a passion. And I was really quite ashamed of myself in that regard as well. So I didn't Make this bargain, you know, with dear God, if you let me live, you know, like, <laughs> like in a Christmas story, then I'm going to change everything around. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I recognized that if I lived, things had to change. And, and in, a, in that accident, which was quite significant, I, I broke my back, I suffered severe internal injuries uh, and uh, did some significant damage to my neck as well. So I had quite a long time to convalesce and really was thinking about, you know, what's what's the next step. And one of the things that I often talk about, Connie, is, you know, we make actions, and this is often the case in business as well, that our actions are often motivated by fear and or the expectations of others. You know, that, you know, we've 
committed to doing something and people are expecting us to, to act in a certain way. So it took me a considerable amount of time to recover. And, and I did go back to work at the original job, you know, the, the consulting firm that I was building. And nothing was ever really the same for me. I just My heart just was not in it ever again. And, and I stuck it out longer than I should have, mostly for fear of letting people down, to be, to be quite honest. I mean, with, with hindsight, I, I see that very clearly. But I walked away from it. And I walked away from it with the intent of doing something different. I had no idea what that was going to be. Um, I had some money saved up. So it literally went from you know that 60 to 80 hours a week grind to zero. And for high achievers or people that you know, work hard. Yeah, that's tough. When you do that, you don't really know what to do with yourself. And, and so you know, you're wrestling with wasted time. I spent time and money doing this thing. And you know, now here I am, what do I do? And so I, I wound up in a grocery store and I... This was at kind of the the dawn of social media. So, you know, MySpace, for those who remember it, was was the thing. Facebook was just in its infancy at the time and only available for college students. It was nothing like it was now. And I heard, you know, a couple of, of mothers in in line talking about my daughter's doing this thing on. Have you ever heard of this MySpace? What is it? And I I usually don't butt into other people's conversations, but in this instance. I, you know, politely said, Hey, you know, I have some experience in computer security and told them a few things and their eyes got kind of big and and one thing led to another. And so now I found myself speaking. They said, Hey, can you come to our, our PTA and talk about internet safety? It's not like I had a lot on my calendar. So I said, Yes, sure, happy to. And so now all of a sudden I'm doing something free. I'm doing something altruistically. I'm doing something that makes my past experiences in technology seem that it wasn't a waste of time, that it was worthwhile. And and as it happened, there was in the audience uh, a, a police officer who was a member of that city's cybercrime unit. I don't know why he wasn't up there giving this PTA speech, but he he heard what I had to say and, and was really impressed by it. And so we we started teaming up. And so now I'm kind of doing the circuit tour and I'm, I'm giving these lectures on internet safety to parents in, in pretty large forums. And it felt quite good. I wasn't charging. Again, I was just having fun and was experiencing something really wonderful. Because when you take the profit out of it, and, and not that profit is bad, so I'm not saying that at all. But when, when you strip away material things, when you strip away revenue streams, and when you get at what you're passionate about and, and find something that helps others, it really opens a degree of fulfillment that most people haven't experienced and I certainly hadn't until that time. And so, you know, the next evolution out of that was at one of these school events, I was approached by a school administrator asking me if I would be willing to volunteer as a mentor because they had plenty of female mentors for their at-risk uh, adolescents, but none who could help and they didn't have males. So I said, sure, I'll do it. And worked with a kid for two years, which I found to be very rewarding. And, and I'm not you know, so arrogant as to say I'm the reason his life turned around, but I was part of that change process. And that again, felt really, really good. So that, you know, after, <laughs> after swearing off uh, classrooms for the rest of my life, which is something I said <laughs> at the age of 23, I found myself you know, in my 30s now entering graduate school and ended up with a master's degree in social work, a master's degree in psychology, and a doctorate in clinical psychology with subspecialties in forensic and neuropsychology. So that really brought things forward to me today to where, again, everything that I try and do now is mission-driven. And when I became very granularly clear on what my personal focus is, which is helping make a difference in the lives of others, even if it's of no direct benefit to myself, then it's able to use that from go and find ways to implement that in your professional life to give you fulfillment, freedom, and have all the kinds of things that entrepreneurs wish they could do. Again, and you know, things always spiral. And of course, you know, that led to me creating the Daily Helping Podcast and 
my charity for children, Every Kid Rocks, which provides speech, physical, and occupational therapy to kids that just need a boost to reach their true potential. So that, Connie, is my story of how everything evolved from being a very materialistic, corporate-focused, you know, 20-something that just wanted to acquire things to what I'm doing today and, and my brand and platform, which serve to help others and educate on the science of altruism. That's a pretty amazing story. And it really sounds like throughout this journey, you were able to define a, a clear purpose for for yourself and really what creates fulfillment versus what you said before, which was, you know, at times when you're younger, you assume you want material things or you assume that I think for a lot of people when you're starting off, maybe climbing that corporate ladder, the thought of achieving more power and influence in that regard is what fulfills you. And it was clear that it wasn't. It wasn't something that fulfilled you. It wasn't. And I wanted it to be, you know, like, because those are the expectations, right? We go to, you know, for those of us that go to college, like, what what do they teach you? You know, you go to college, the expectations are if you're going to college, you're going to get out and you're going to be able to get a better job and you're going to be able to climb that ladder or reach for that opportunity to have success on your own. I mean, but but we look at that generally speaking in financial terms, right? Like, how many people, how many people do you talk to? who are recent graduates who say, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm really excited now that I'm out of college that I, I want to do things. Um, I want to do things that really are in line with my core values and, and make me happy. That's not what people say. People say, you know, they're looking to get into X demographic, X business sector, you know, buy the house, do all these things. And again, there's nothing wrong with all of that. But society has pushed us in a particular way that, that we have an emphasis on the material. And not only do we have an emphasis on the material, which has kind of always been there in Western society, but because of social media and the impact that technology in general has had on personality functioning, it's a keeping up with the Joneses mentality more than ever before. Because if we're not able to demonstrate in social media that you know we are happy and doing all of these amazing things, uh, we actually, research shows we actually internalize that in our at higher risk for significant emotional distress than those that don't. It's really quite interesting. Oh, that is interesting. Well, so as a subject matter expert on the science of altruism, I've, I'd love for you to share with us more on what the research has shown us and how that specifically applies to business. Because you know, there's certainly been a trend or even movement, I could say, over the past decade with companies and organizations focusing on doing good and having a clear reason for being or having a purpose. That's right. So it's so wonderful that that has been the case. And there are people in the forefront of this, like Bob Berg, who who has been a guest on my show, and I'm privileged to know him. The the focus is starting to shift. There's the conscious capitalism movement. There's all these entities that are out there that are pushing. Profits are great, and they are, but let's focus on doing some good with them. And so when we talk about altruism, you know, there's there's different ways of looking at that. So you know, the, the true definition of altruism is helping someone with no expectation of receiving something in return. There's no reciprocity expected. It's just simply you want to do something good for the, for the sake of doing something good. And what's really interesting about it is we live in an era where in addition to our technology that, you know, in our personal devices and all these things, the advances in in neuroscience have been incredible. And so one of the things that we're able to do is utilize real-time diagnostic imaging. And we actually can tell when we're engaged in certain kinds of activities, what parts of the brains light up in real time, uh, what neurotransmitters get released into our bodies. It's really wonderful. So as an example, Let's say, you know, kind of you go outside today and somebody gives you $1,000. That would be awesome. And if your brain was being monitored in real time, we would see parts of your brain light up. The reward center of our brain, which is a very ancient part of our, our brain, it's called the mesolimbic pathway. That would be lighting up like a Christmas tree. Now, here's what's interesting. If you then turned around and you gave somebody $1,000 and we're still mon- monitoring your brain, same exact parts of the brain light up. That is, from a neurobiological standpoint, there is zero distinction what happens in our bodies. 
between, between helping and between giving. However, going back to you know the, the statements we were talking about a little bit ago, from the standpoint of Western society in particular, we are so focused on material things and we are so focused on me, 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 that this is kind of lost. So part of my mission is to educate people that it feels just as good to give as it does to receive, which is really phenomenal. As Dr. Schuster indicated, society has pushed us in a particular way that, that we have an emphasis on the material. And for him, and certainly countless others, he's learned that this didn't create the fulfillment that he was looking for. And through his own personal and professional experiences, this focus on helping others has just been as rewarding and fulfilling than receiving. And that's all backed up by science. It's something that he lives by every day. He also fundamentally believes that business success is rooted in altruism. I know you have this belief that to really win in business, your focus really needs to be on helping others, period. So why is it? Not just from the chemical or from what you see in the brain, but you know how that is paid off, how you've seen that paid off. Just personally, um, and, and other maybe examples that you've seen with clients and, and such. And so Harvey McKay's, you know, he's got a, a lot of books and, and most of them have the, the term shark in the title, but he had one about swim with the sharks without being eaten alive. And it, it talks about selling and negotiating. So from a business standpoint, you, know, you, have, you have the traditional kind of sales mindset that says you can, these people who believe that they can you know, sell ice cube to Eskimos and, and beachfront property in the desert, those sorts of things. When your mission, your purpose, your business is aligned with core values that you believe in and you promote, there's none of that game. There's none of that, let me put on my you know, sales face and be able to convince you of why you need my product or services. When it's mission-driven, the passion of what you're doing is going to shine through. The purpose of your organization shines through. And it resonates with a degree of genuineness that you wouldn't have otherwise. So that's one thing. Uh, The other thing that's interesting, and uh, another name that I'll drop who is phenomenal in this is Paul Jayzak. And Paul Jayzak is the guy when it comes to studying neuroscience and business. And he talks a lot about oxytocin, which many people might have heard about. And it's a hormone that promotes feelings of trust. And so this, you know, to, to... break out a little bit of neuroscience. It's produced in the hypothalamus. It's released into our bloodstream. And there have been many, many studies on oxytocin and what the presence of oxytocin means to our bodies. And certainly it, it does promote feelings of trust. But what's interesting is it lessens levels of stress and anxiety. It elevates one's move. And what's interesting is that people who have higher levels of oxytocin have far fewer sick days at work. And you know, from the standpoint of teams, there is a greater collaborative experience when there's higher degrees of oxytocin. So when you have people that have come together that get behind the values and the mission of a particular company's objective, they create better teams. They work more synergistically. They're more excited about the work that they're doing. They have fewer sick days and on and on and on, Connie. There's there's literally countless examples of how when a a workplace that is mission-driven is of greater benefit to the company in terms of the bottom line and certainly in terms of employee satisfaction. So, you know, that's interesting you said, I guess my previous guest, who is the head of business development at The Fool, was talking about the importance of alignment and what he's calling this value exchange in order to be really effective in that particular role, but really effective for everyone. Where he said that if you know his team isn't fully aligned with the goals of what they're trying to do, it becomes difficult. It can become contentious. And you know, his his philosophy and perspective is really about, you know, how can I help you? What value can I provide to you first versus what can I get out of it? It was definitely this, you know, winning for we versus winning for me. 
I, I love that. And that's very much in align with you know the, the research that I've seen and and my personal position as well is that the first question that I ask people when I engage them is how can I add value to what you're doing? And when you take that perspective, people are going to be willing to help you achieve whatever you're trying to do. And, and certainly from an entrepreneurial standpoint, in particular, if you have employees, if your objective is to help your employees get what they want in terms of satisfaction and their goals, your higher goals with respect to your entrepreneurial mission and your corporation in general are going to be taken care of almost automatically. Do you feel though that our instant gratification oriented culture these days gets in the way because this is somewhat playing the long game. You know, if you be nice to others, you would hope they'd be nice to you. If you put others first and really think of the overarching goal, then hopefully everybody will follow. But in many times and in a lot of you know corporate environments, it's just it's not the case. You know, and I think it can be quite transactional. You know, every culture is different in a corporation. And we we certainly and there's examples of this. I mean, you could the newer corporations, B Corps, for example, you know, tend to be more mission driven, of course. Uh, these older corporations, these Fortune 500 companies, which you know, this is a different way of thinking for them. I mean, basically, you mentioned the paradigm has been shifting for around 10 years or so, and that's that's probably the right time frame to think about. But you know, many companies that have been around for a hundred years don't think about things in that way. Even if the corporate culture isn't where maybe we would hope it would be. Within that corporation, within that hierarchy, you can choose as an employee to still be that agent of change from from a positive standpoint and say, hey, you know, again, how how can I be part of this team? How can I within my division be helpful? It, the long game, sure. You know, I mean, it is certainly from an entrepreneurial standpoint, it is. One of the things that that we do see and and it does tend to be more prevalent in in millennials say than in in Gen Xers or boomers is that push for instant gratification and i think it does go back to what we talked about earlier is that social media has a, a lot to do with it and what what happens with social media is there's this reinforcing effect if you will to where essentially if you get on uh, on social media there's this feedback loop. And social media is interesting because you know, a lot of people talk about internet addiction and in it. I, I'm not saying that everybody that uses social media is addicted to it. But what I will say is from a neurobiological standpoint, every time somebody likes your post, you get a little hit of dopamine. <laughs> kind of like you're taking a puff off of a cigarette and you get you get that instant boost of, of fe- feeling great. And so what ends up happening is we create an identity for ourselves. Uh, Back in the early evolution of the internet before social media, but when people started making personally branded websites, this was referred to as the trophy case presentation. And that is there's things that we have to put out there that society expects us to show to the world, which may not necessarily be congruent with what we're actually experiencing internally. So... Back to the instant gratification, where this ties in, Connie, is that you know we might have a particular goal, and maybe it is a long-term goal, but everybody in our social media circle is you know posting things right now: new car, new house, vacation, you know, life is wonderful, all of these things. And this doesn't happen to anybody or everybody, I should say, but it does happen. Is that you? You have a higher risk depending on a number of factors, to really internalize that and not only feel the pressure to compete with that, but that one might become depressed or anxious if they don't fulfill that. So we do often find ourselves at odds with those two things, is that you know we want to show to the world how awesome we are today, look at me, <laughs> versus... I'm starting this company and I'm the guy who right now I'm answering the phones, I'm sweeping the floors, I'm doing everything. I'm the secretary, I'm the this, I'm the that. And so, you know, what we're really experiencing may not be congruent with what society wants us to be. And we just have to be aware of it, you know, and and recognize, you know, how to be okay in the space that we're at. 
and know that, you know, if we continue here back to the long game, as you said, that if, if you continue being true to your core values and your mission, that you will eventually achieve the goal you set out to achieve. So certainly there's one thing for businesses to find their purpose, but yet at the end of the day, we all know that it starts and ends with individuals. So the things that you just said, it really sounds like it comes down to you defining you know, what, what your purpose is, what your mission is. How does that align to you know, the, the company? And hopefully you're passionate about that too in order to help you move things forward right? from both sides. Um, so what other things do you feel inhibit people? From focusing on taking an altruistic approach. I mean, you talked about you know, quite a few, but I'm just wondering if there's anything else that you would add to that. Fear is one for sure. That you know, within the corporate culture they may be in, and it it may be you know, it may be frowned upon. I, I was just reading this morning the article on what the corporate culture was like allegedly in Papa John's, who was in all kinds of trouble in the media. Right, and, and, and so that type of environment sounded like it was quite toxic and hostile, particularly to females. And so, you know, an environment like that wouldn't be the best place for one to self-actualize and and really add value in a way that that's very altruistic. So, you know, so I, I say fear because if you're working, and that's an extreme example of if what was reported is true. But if you're working in a culture, this company culture in many ways determines how people are going to act. Any environmental culture, any environmental stimuli is going to cause somebody to react as a result of it. So if the culture doesn't promote it, one might be afraid to do that. And so and I'm not telling you, hey, if your if your company, you know, doesn't have a mission of, you know, Saving the planet, quit your job. I'm not saying that at all, but I, I do think that you know you do have to be honest with yourself and say, hey, you know, for for me to have maximum fulfillment, can I function where I'm at? And if I can't, what are potentially some other avenues in which I can I can meet that? You know, a lot of people will come up to me and they say, well, you know, it's easy for you to say, you know, you're a clinical psychologist; it's your job to help others. And and my response to that is, you don't have to be, you know, a, a healthcare professional. To, to help people. You know, it, it starts with what, what fires you, what's important to you. I mean, you have to know your values first. And if you don't know what your values are, then you're, you're never going to be able to steer that ship. And there's you know, countless books and websites and instruments and things that people can take online to really help clarify what their values are. Because from your values, then you can derive specific missions. So you know, back to the example I, I was just talking about that, and it, maybe you really want to help kids, but you're an accountant. So volunteer at a boys and girls club. There's different ways to be able to get that fulfillment in your life and out of your life because we need the fulfillment. It doesn't necessarily have to come from the workplace or, or from outside it. But for most people, they do need to, to have that sense of purpose in, in their lives. Taking an altruistic approach, one where you think of adding value or helping others first, can be stymied by your company culture, fear, and even what you see on social media. To break through that inertia, Dr. Richard tells us it starts with what's important to you, which entails knowing your own personal values, define your own mission and purpose, align that to your work life. Yet finding those things that give you fulfillment and purpose don't have to come from your day-to-day business life either. Well, so what other um, recommendations do you have in terms of breaking through that inertia? You already just started to lay out uh, some. Um, and you know, my takeaway from the one that you just mentioned is that to find, um, to break through that inertia, it's looking internally, potentially, if that's possible in your work environment, but also not limiting that. Um, look outside because the things that you can do outside is something that you probably could take inside in, in your day-to-day business life. Yes. And one of the things that I would also say is quite important is who you choose to surround yourself with. So now, you know, before your audience drones, because here comes the classic Jim Rohn quote about you're the average of the five people you hang around with, which every self-help podcast has to have. So if I'm the first one to share it on your show, you know, pop a cork because, you know, every <laughs> everybody on a self-help podcast talks about that quote. But I'm more interested in talking about the why behind that. And so from an, a 
brain standpoint, a brain functioning standpoint, we've actually learned in the last 10 years or so about these little guys hanging up on our head called mirror neurons. And so I, I, I was asked by NBC about half a year ago to help them with an article on what happens to our brain when we watch football. And so what's, what's interesting about this is like, if you think about sports, so you know, if, if you're at a football game or a soccer game or what have you, and your team scores, you may jump up in jubilation and you may high five or hug total strangers. Translate that to an environment outside of sports. There's no way that happens, right? Like if you just went up to somebody and hugged them on a subway, you know, you're, you may go to jail or you might get punched in the face, right? So these things in our brain called mirror neurons are basically there to help us feel comfortable and connect to people that we feel like we're in alignment with. So sports was an example, but it certainly holds true in business and it certainly holds true in other aspects of our life. We understand that we take on the persona, those neurons in our brains, they're called mirror neurons for a reason because we mirror those people that we spend the most time, most amount of time with. So part of becoming in alignment and finding what your purpose is, once you've done that first step and you've really become very crystal clear on what your values are, and once you find what's important to you, you have to surround yourself with people who share that mindset or share that commitment. So it doesn't mean like if you want to, if your passion is, you know, creating a no-kill shelter for dogs, that doesn't mean that you have to surround yourself just with people that want to do the same thing. But you have to surround yourself with people that think and like the same kind of ideas, generally speaking, that you do. You know, if you are very negative and you surround yourself with negative people, you're not going to break out of that cycle. So once you start finding what you're passionate about, joining organizations, and they can be professional organizations, they don't have to be professional organizations, but you surround yourself with a new circle, a circle that has similar values to what you're doing. And then the next thing that I would say is, is critical is once you so you have your values, you have a mission, you have a circle, and then as you move towards defining these into goals, whatever those goals may be, you surround yourself with people who will hold you accountable for those actions. And when you do those things, you find yourself walking this life. Helen Keller used to talk about that she essentially uh, that you know, she was truly like the first one to say fake it till you make it, and so. You know, essentially, she got to a point where she was believing certain things that that she had all these talents and abilities, and and then she looked back after time, and lo and behold, she was changing the world for people with who were deaf and blind. <laughs> it's amazing. So, um, you know, there there's a lot of examples like that, and and that's a little bit of an extreme one, but having the clarity, having the people to hold you accountable, having the people who will support you, these are things that are just part of the recipe for success that you know hard work is one thing and I'm not saying if you don't have those things you can't achieve a goal but when you have those other boxes checked off it makes it far far more easy to succeed so any additional words of wisdom words of wisdom be very true to yourself and even if you've had people in your ear your whole life telling you not to do something be be very clear with yourself based on your values about what it is that you want to do and take action so that all of the things that you do in your life personally and professionally drill back to your core values. And also knowing what you know now, what advice would you give your younger self? It's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I actually have a story that that immediately came to mind when you said that to me. When I was doing my residency and we were feeling quite overwhelmed, one of, one of the, the supervisors, who was a, a postdoctoral, said to us, you know, the work always gets done. And I kind of cocked my head a little bit like a dog who hears a word that he thinks he understands but doesn't quite understand. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said that, you know, we have obligations and we always get the work done. But it's okay to know that you can shut your laptop off. And I said, huh, 
And as, as a business owner, multiple business owner, as a parent, that really resonates with me. And I, I think what I would have told myself when I was younger is it is okay, in fact, to walk away from what you're doing. Because we can always tell ourselves that we can, you know, if we just send out one more email, if we just finish this presentation, if we just do X, Y, and Z, um, that that's something that we have to do because we're entrepreneurs. But in fact, and particularly I'm speaking to those of, of your audience who are parents, your family grows as you're sitting there sending those emails and doing those things. So it is okay to close the computer down and spend time with our loved ones. And, and we can always pick it up the next day. And finally, what's the best way listeners can connect with you? So the best way to connect with me is at thedailyhelping.com. And actually, Connie, if it's okay, I'd like to give away something to your listeners. Absolutely. So if you go to thedailyhelping.com forward slash contest, one of the things that we offer through our show is a service called Personal Helping. And it is a really exciting coaching service that we have. And we spent many years developing it. And it's heavily grounded in neuroscience. So if you go to thedailyhelping.com forward slash contest, you can enter to win some personal helping. We give some away every single month. That's is our way of giving back to the world. And uh, But the dailyhelping.com is the mothership of everything that we're doing in terms of the podcast. And uh, additionally, when this airs, we will probably have launched my nonprofit for kids, which is called everykidrocks.org. And you can go there and sign up to help kids in your community achieve their true potential or volunteer and would be certainly grateful for spreading the word about that because our goal is to help 10,000 children a year through this organization. And in your Daily Helping podcast, I know you have that mission to get a million people every day to conduct acts of kindness, right? Yes, absolutely. So that's part of the show's push is to get a million people every day to commit acts of kindness for others and post them in their social media feeds using the hashtag my daily helping because again what we tell everybody on our uh, on the daily helping podcast is that the happiest people are those that help others so if you do that uh, that would be great because you will feel good and you will make a difference in the life of somebody else thank you so much for being on the show today dr richard really fabulous insight i love being here connie thanks so much It can be a challenge to constantly think and act in a way that's all about helping others because it's easy to fall back into thinking about the instant benefit or advantage one gets for themselves. But it's playing the long game because the fact of the matter is that altruism and purpose can help you build business momentum within an organization, your team, and you personally. It isn't just a nice thought. It's a sound business strategy and maybe just your competitive advantage in the coming years. Thanks for listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast. You can learn more about Dr. Richard by listening to the Daily Helping Podcast and connecting with him at thedailyhelping.com. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe to the show on iTunes and leave us a review. This is what helps others find our podcast. You can also find us in the Google Play Store, Spotify, and Stitcher Radio. If you want to hear previous episodes or even get show notes from this episode, you can also visit us on our podcast page at flywheelassociates.com slash podcast. I'm Connie Steele, and you've been listening to the Strategic Momentum Podcast.